Welcome everyone. We're going to just wait a few moments to give people time to hop on. We'll start in about two minutes. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. We're just gonna wait one more minute for people to log in. So please take the next few moments to do what you need to do so you can comfortably join the conversation today. All right, I think we're good to get started. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. For those who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Jordan Costa and I'm the project manager for the Community Violence Initiative at Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Giffords is a national advocacy organization dedicated to saving lives from gun violence led by former Arizona Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, who has been personally invested in the topic for over a decade. Just last week, Gabby received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in recognition of her commitment and courage to fighting an epidemic that has not only altered her life, but the lives of so many in our country on a daily basis. Today in the United States, the leading cause of death for children and adolescents is gun violence, and now more than ever, we need action. We need courage, and we need investment in efforts that are making a difference. With that being said, I want to take a brief moment before we get started to recognize all of you who courageously wake up every day to cultivate a future of hope and safety for us all. And I want you to know that we see you and it's truly an honor to fight alongside you. This webinar marks the final installment of our four part series in partnership with the Northwestern Neighborhood and Network Initiative, also known as N3, focused on the field of community violence. If you've tuned into each conversation from this series so far, I wanna thank you on behalf of everyone who's contributed to this effort, especially our speakers who have so graciously taken the time to share their expertise with us on a variety of topics. If this is your first time tuning in or you've missed one or two panels, I thank you for coming and encourage you to visit the Giffords YouTube channel where you can find recordings of our previous installations. To quickly recap, our series began with a conversation about the meaning of CVI, the nuances of the work and why it's important. We then took a deeper dive into understanding the lived experiences of outreach workers and the complexities of the profession that make it both incredibly difficult yet incredibly necessary. After that, we looked at best practices and innovative strategies to support the health, well-being, and safety of community frontline workers. And today, we'll, we'll round out the conversation with a discussion on CVI and policing, where we plan to explore the complex, sometimes volatile relationship between outreach workers and law enforcement officers, describe the roles and responsibilities of each, and discuss how workers from both professions can best coexist and achieve their shared goal of safe and thriving communities. We're lucky to be joined today by an impressive panel of speakers who have a demonstrated history of being committed to the cause of reducing community violence in a range of contexts and who I'm certain we'll all be able to learn something from today. A reminder that there is a Q&A feature on this webinar that we encourage you to use if you have any questions. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to our moderator who is equally as impressive as everybody on our panel, Executive Director of Urban Peace Institute, Fernando Rejon, who will introduce our experts and facilitate today's conversation. Thank you, Jordan, and um, thank you to Giffords and N3 for, for pulling this together. Um, it's an impressive series of conversations that are really uh, vital during this time um, when CVI is, is evolving onto the national scale, into the national scale. Uh, my name is Fernando Rejon. I am the executive director of the Urban Peace Institute. I'm happy to be here with my colleagues, um, many of who I, who I know and have worked with for, for a long period of time. 
I'll be moderating today's conversation um, on this important topic of the intersections. Where does the CBI field um, align with law enforcement? Where are the boundaries? Um, what are our professional understandings? And how do you really build um, a, some type of interaction between law enforcement and CBI street outreach workers on the ground? So some cities have established a level of interaction with law enforcement, and some cities, um, their CBI programs have no interaction with law enforcement. So we really have to look at the spectrum there. There are some program models that are heavy law enforcement driven and some that do not interact with law enforcement at all. So along that spectrum, you know, we wanna discuss what's effective, um, what works and give some examples from really two major cities that have really heavily invested in building out a community-based public safety infrastructure, um, such as Los Angeles and Chicago, but also have some level of interaction and professional understandings with the local uh, police departments. So it's important to recognize the parallel roles of each group and particularly the independence of street outreach and working to achieve public safety. So for, for years, public safety has remained the sole domain of law enforcement, but with the evolution of the CVI field has worked to broaden the nation's understanding of safety to include a community-based safety efforts, such as community intervention or street outreach. So I'm happy to be joined today um, by a group of panelists. We will put their bios in the chat function so that you could read them. So we're, we're not gonna go through that in order to save some time to ensure that we have a robust conversation. So we have Chief, Chief Ernest Cato, um, Bureau of Counterterrorism, Chicago PD, Captain Ryan Whiteman, um, assigned to the LAPD Community Safety Partnership Bureau, Tenny Gross, Executive Director of the Institute for Nonviolence Chicago, and Ben Taco Owens, who's the Executive Director of Detours Mentoring Group in Los Angeles. Um, before we get to our panelists, I wanted to just offer a, a definition of professional understanding, but also just talk through some of the boundaries and standards that um, many groups work with. So the professional understanding is there's really a mutual respect for the boundaries and limitation of each profession. Um, these professions work in parallel to each other. Um, you know, there, there sometimes is communication. Um, sometimes that communication goes one way. Um, it's very important for the CVI field to really understand what those boundaries are and their role so that they don't cross those boundaries and compromise their legitimacy in the community. Um, in Los Angeles, we, we had developed uh, professional standards of conduct and practice. Um, veteran intervention workers put these together. There's 18. Um, we use these, Urban Peace Institute uses these nationally, um, but particularly in LA through the LA Violence Intervention Training Academy, which certifies um, city contracted gang intervention workers. There's 18 of them, but the, there's three that, that really are important to the conversation today. One is never cross the yellow tape. Two is never tell or inform on any neighborhood group or person. And three is do not incriminate another person. Um, these are um, standards that we hold near and dear to the field. Um, and we wanna make sure that um, it is very clear uh, what the role is of street outreach and intervention um, as both groups, law enforcement and the CVI field are moving toward to achieve public safety. So with that, I wanted to uh, get started. Um, the first question that I have, and there's, I'm gonna ask everyone to be as succinct as possible and just try to answer it um, as thoroughly as possible, but, but be succinct based on your experiences. And like I said, we have representatives from Chicago and LA um, in this conversation. So the first topic area is how to build a professional understanding between law enforcement and street outreach or intervention. Um, cities across the country are, who are building out their arch new architecture on community-based public safety efforts, they have this question. And so it's a very important question, timely question right now. But the sub questions to that are, how long does it take? What needs to be in place to make it effective? And what are or should be the firewalls between law enforcement and street outreach or intervention? So with that, um, I'd like to start with uh, Chief Cato and, and Tenny. Um, if you could share maybe Chicago's experience with that, um, and then we'll move to, to the LA folks. Um, but maybe we could start with Chief Cato, or Chief Cato, sorry. You know, you the question of how long will it takes, that depends how open your mind is. It also depends on the relationship that you build with that group. Uh, first of all, you're gonna have to believe in what you're doing. If you don't believe in it, it's not gonna succeed. But it's, from the police side, we have to learn the boundaries of that particular group because you have to be aware that you spoke about some uh, some boundaries that those groups have. Never be a uh, informant, maybe never across the yellow tape. So we have to understand the boundaries of that group first. 
after we understand the boundaries of that group, then we can start working our relationship. And I think uh, Tinny can speak a little bit more on it on how we built our relationship with me first respecting those boundaries. And then at the same time, understand how to utilize his group's uh, abilities in those gang conflicted areas that we've had. That was succinct. Um... I think when I came to Chicago, when I was asked to come to Chicago, there was a history of difficulty uh, sometimes between outreach and policing. And uh, I met, I think, with 15 district commanders and their staffs. And I described the work and what I'm used to it. For me, it's all started 30 years ago in Boston. And then in Providence, where both policing went through a deep change and outreach was uh, formed and a civilian architecture. I made one promise to law enforcement in Chicago that we will not go to the papers. We will not go to the media. And when we have challenges and they will come, uh, we will sort it out among ourselves. We will talk directly to leaders in policing here. And we ask for them to extend the same courtesy to us. We're taking a significant risk. We're hiring population sometimes didn't work, has a lot of serious records when it comes to society and policing. So it's not a, so the tension is there, you gotta acknowledge it from the get-go. Uh, and you gotta, you gotta explain the, the firewalls, right? That we can, we work in the spaces that the government is not unfortunately at the moment perfectly legitimate. And at the same time, you gotta recognize law enforcement oxygen is gathering information. That's how they solve crime. So you understand they need information and we cannot provide it. So explaining that, say, if it's 30 people on your team, that they are not part of your pool for, for witnesses and solving your crime and, and helping and telling law enforcement, if you keep doing what you do, we're not intervening in that. But we will start getting to places where we do have a shared goal, which is reduction of violence. And that's something easier to explain and get a buy-in from leaders in policing as opposed to the rank and file. And you got to understand that we're not looking here for full conversion. Uh, we're looking to explain. And when Chief Cato, when he was a commander of a district, said, look, I'm throwing you alone to the roll calls so that you can face them without the presence of a commander so that they can ask you a question and probe. We knew it's not easy, but you got to be willing to do that. Uh, my red line is that the people we hire, we don't own them. They're giving us life's worth of Rolodexes. They don't have anywhere to go. This is their roots, and we cannot compromise their safety. And that's how we started it. It takes a long time. There's crisis sometimes, uh, but there's also moments. Two months ago, a female outreach worker was shot in one of our neighborhoods, and Chief Cato called me after he loaded her into the ambulance and she was really happy to see him. She thought she's going, that she won't make it. Uh, and knowing him, knowing his compassion. So there's also relationships that are being built and because we trust him that he respects our boundaries and the risk we take in doing this work, people buy into that. Thank you for that, Tenny and, and Chief Cato. Um, we'll move to the, the LA folks, um, Captain Whiteman and, and Ben, um, and I'll, I'll restate the question, but the, the first topic area is, you know, how do you build that professional understanding between law enforcement and street outreach? You know, how long does it take? Some people might think, hey, it happens overnight. Um, what needs to be in place to make it effective, which is an important question. And what should the firewalls be? And, and maybe, Captain, if you can, and I've heard you speak about this eloquently, but if you can um, share a little bit, even about the autonomy that, that intervention has um, when, it, when it comes to public safety. Right, so first of all, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're viewing this from. Uh, thank you for having me. <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I, I think one of the biggest things from an organizational perspective is having the commitment from your top leadership to leaving key individuals and roles that are able to develop that relationship. Many times in law enforcement, because there's a lot of fluidity with staffing, especially at the top levels, we see captains come and go. And if you have areas that are entrenched with gang violence and community wellness is compromised because of, of a number of 
factors, whether it be housing, lack of education, lack of employment, and things of this nature. If you keep switching leadership from a PD standpoint, this will fail. I've been fortunate enough in my career as I've been engaged with, with our grid teams, our intervention workers since 2007 when we started as a gang officer in South Los Angeles. And I've been fortunate enough to work my way through the, the different ranks of LAPD, staying in South Los Angeles as a gang sergeant, as a gang lieutenant, and now in my current role as the uh, commanding officer of our housing development areas, uh, which have a number of problems, but have wonderful people that deserve to succeed. So first of all, we have to maintain that consistency with our folks, with our, not only our gang intervention workers that are doing the life-saving work on the ground, but with our mayor's office people for the model that we, that we use with our regional program coordinators, with the CBOs that are contracted and, and, and managing our CIWs, those relationships only work if you're there all the time and that you have touch points, to, to be frank with you, daily. Uh, that's how it has worked for me. As far as letting intervention work, PD needs to get out of the way. We need to get out of the way and we need to let them do that violence interdiction when we have crisis, when we don't have crisis, we need to get out of the way and let them operate in these neighborhoods to provide the programming, provide opportunity, and provide general just hope in areas that have lacked that due to a variety of reasons. And we need to let them be there and be with the people that need services uh, to be able to amplify the impact of what intervention is trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis. I will say for me, and I'll, I'll keep it at this, modeling behavior from a leadership standpoint, from the chief of police all the way down to the field sergeant is the most important thing to be able to change organizations outlook on the utilization and building a professional relationship with intervention. When my cops, see me or my sergeants or my lieutenants go out and have friendly, real conversations with intervention workers, because I believe, I, I totally agree with Tenny. The one thing that all of us want is less people being shot and less people being killed. I don't care if you're the most hardened gang member, and I tell my people this, no one deserves to get shot and lose their life in a street, on a corner, in a park, no one, no one deserves that. And that's what we're driving toward. That is the unifying goalpost for LAPD and the, and the various agencies that work within Los Angeles to mitigate and intervene on violence. So for me, my first calls are to my grid folks. My first calls after a shooting are to my grid folks. They're not to the investigators. They're not to my cops. I will get to them because I know what they're doing, but we need to loop our grid folks in and let them work. 99% of them, just like 99% of the cops are good folks that want to do a great job. And then there's always a, a few bad apples, which we deal with through whatever processes, but that's not PD's job either. That's not our job to do HR for the, for the uh, intervention workers. So. My, my experience is, is, is so positive uh, over the past geez, uh, 15, 16 years and the evolution and the professional uh, structure that's been created in LA is very, very impressive to me. So I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Ben talk though, because I, I tend to talk too much. <laughs> Thank you, Captain. Go ahead, Ben. All right, well, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, pleasure and the honor to be here. It's always inspiring. To chime in with people across the country about this work and, and how it's being done and having an impact on so many lives in this country. Uh, I, I would say the professional understanding uh, with the intervention uh, culture here in Los Angeles and with LAPD uh, could take days, it could take years uh, to develop. It's always a ongoing 
process um, and uh, kind of like to Captain uh, Whiteman's point, uh, there's, you know, a change of the guard and leadership often. And, you know, I, I think the inside joke with the intervention is, is uh, they're probably going to live to be 137 years old. Uh, so we, we see leadership change. We see captains. We see. And, and so uh, we want to maintain the same protocols um, of intervention with, within the department. But a lot of time, um, we see musical chairs, uh, we see leadership change or retire, uh, go somewhere else. And then again, we have to start the conversation over um, and you know integrate what we're doing um, with that new leadership. So I, I would say, you know, there's a lot of meetings that take place continuous over and over and over again, just to keep us updated, uh, you know, with the trends. Uh, what is going on, how we're going to interact with law enforcement. Uh, and it, again, it's just continuous. Uh, one thing that uh, stays the same, remains the same, that doesn't change with the interventionists and the professional understanding is that we don't solve crimes. Uh, that's just not our platform. That's not what we're there for. That's not part of our interaction. And to be honest, there's times where we have to even say, we don't even want to be accredited for solving crimes. So, you know, there's kudos to be given and say, hey, thanks, Taco. You know, you helped do this, that, and the other. Uh, a lot of times it has to be um, vocalized in a certain manner to where it's articulated that we aren't, you know, solving crimes. Uh, we're, we have a professional understanding in the work that we do and how it's done. And our role is to service the community. And we all want safer communities, but we do have to make sure that it's clear um, that our roles, our engagement is not uh, crime solving within law enforcement. Thank you, Ben. So, I mean, that, that just, it, it takes us to implementation because there's, there's one thing to build it out. How do you kind of build that, that interaction, that professional understanding? The next step is implementation where the rubber meets the road. So how do you, once you build that understanding and you understand the mutual roles, how do you implement it in the street? When the crisis happens, the incident happens at the ground level, what, what does each group do? And then, and even if you could even use um, examples, right? What, um, what works and what doesn't work? And I think it's important to know what works, but it's also just important to know what doesn't work. Um, so we'll go back to Chief Cato and, and Tenney in Chicago. Chief? Well, you know, <clears throat> Chief spoke of some, about something very important early on when he talked about being introduced to our roll calls. That was the form of implement, implementation right away. So I instructed Tenney, I said, you know, it's all right for you to come to me and ask me this. I could see the vision. But the goal is, is for the officers in my district to understand why you're here and what you're doing. So I asked Tenney, I want you to go to each roll call. I'm going to introduce you. But I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave this roll call so my officers can be honest with you, so they can tell you how you feel, how they can say that they don't want to do this, how they can say that they don't trust the guys at work, guys, guys or girls at work for you. So that was the first part of it, to have Tenny not only go to the roll calls, but then he had to go to my tactical officers, my officers who will actually be doing the real engagement when it comes to gangs in the neighborhood. Well, Tenny agreed to do that also. He found the courage. What we found because he did that, my gang officers then sought him out, out on the street. My gang officers then understood the areas where these outreach workers would be, even to the point where I saw my gang officers with T-shirts that they proudly had of their own, you know, that Tenney's uh, groups had worn. Now, because they understood the organization that Tenney represented, now they were more curious. We then went on to implement that in our... Uh, I call our intelligence room, our SDSC room, where those officers had an idea where each person would be located to the point of even that Tenny's now gonna be notified when a shooting had occurred. So he'll know where to put his resources at. At that point, now my group, was, I'm on the street one night, we have this large gathering out on the street. And we and I looked in that crowd and said, well, you know, I don't wanna send my officers in there. That could become, that, that could be harmful to my officers and may cause some backlash. 
someone in my, one of my officers said, well, why don't we have the outreach workers do it? I said, you know what? That's a good idea. It was about 1.30 in the morning. I gave Tenny a call. He sent them in the area. I saw them respond. I saw the crowd slowly leave. So now that showed proof in the pudding to my guys that they could be effective. Now I explained to the officers in my group, you're gonna see these, these uh, individuals start to show up at shootings. They're not to go on the crime scene, but give them some room and let's see what we can do. Well, we started to, started to slowly see buy-in to even to the point where we start actually putting them into our strategy plans in the district. Where now, okay, I'm gonna create a strategy. Now in this strategy, we're gonna say, this is the Institute of Nonviolence Responsibility during, in this particular area. And we told Tenny about that strategy where he actually was able to now place his resources in that area. Now that was at the district level. Now I'm the area deputy chief. Now we have to get buy-in into the entire area. So we start repeating that same process out, even to the point now that we're gonna have uh, bi-weekly meetings, bi-weekly meetings, and we're gonna talk about the shootings in the areas. Now, their group now is a part of our strategy. All right, so that's the first part of the implementation. And now, it be, now it's understood that Institute is gonna get a phone call for every shooting. I'll let Teddy go from there. Thank you, Chief. And, and the process is never easy. It's never, right? This was really described schematically how it takes. I think Sal from Providence said it's a, always, it, you always have to work on it. There's changes, there's new command, there's a, uh, and I've been now, I think in the district where Cato was the commander, I think we're on number seven, right? So that transition really happens. You got to do maintenance and, uh, I think I think recently, even and maybe a year ago, we did a presentation to the area detectives. Some were really questioning, uh, you know, the question of the innocent victim versus the not innocent victim, and we explained it to us: all victims are the same. Not an easy sell for detectives and homicide detectives, right? But that's what we do. And again, what we do differently and what they do, and. And not everyone agreed. There was a detective that very emotionally, and he's a very dedicated detective, uh, held in his hand a dying three-year-old. It's, it's, you know, you, you got to recognize the traumas on both sides to be human about that. You cannot convince someone immediately, but you got to face the music. With the tactical team, the tactical sergeant asked me uh, if we know of a homicide, homicide, right? It's the biggest thing. Will you not solve it? And I said, I said, Sergeant, I'm a former Sergeant in the Israeli army. What's your first responsibility? He said, is to bring my team back to the station safe. I said, my, my responsibility is exactly the same and I cannot compromise my team. So I think it's, but at the same time, I do feel the pressure and responsibility of civilians that we gotta show up and do their hard work, right? And we gotta be out there. Officers, I think in many ways in the last 30 years have asked, where are the civilians? Why is it that we have to respond to someone's brain on the pavement after molestation, after domestic abuse that is gruesome? All that affects their minds and where are we in the space? So one thing is for us to criticize, but then we demand for civilian ar architecture. We got to really show up. It cannot be that we do narcotics, uh, sorry, when people are trying to get into rehab, only nine to five. We gotta be out there. We gotta, as civilians, show that we're gonna take some of the space to make sure that it's not all falls on officers and they respect that. Thank you, Tenny and Chief. Uh, we'll move to, to the LA group, um, Captain Whiteman and Ben, um, and maybe, maybe share maybe what doesn't work. And go ahead, and then I'll follow you this time. Go, go, go ahead, Captain. Okay. I mean, I th there's always instances where uh, we're going to have folks on both sides, the PD side and the intervention side, <clears throat> that are leery of one another because past experience. I think that's just human nature. But I, again, Tenny, I agree with you that we have to have these conversations. You have to have uh, those that may not believe in programs uh, with uh, violence intervention. Uh, you have to show them why it's important. 
you have to you have to know your people to be able to say, okay, this officer, this detective, this sergeant is ready to step out in the forefront and be engaged with our intervention workers. Because if you don't, and you don't know your people from a PD standpoint, and you push them too early into building those relationships, it could be detrimental to the organization and to, and to the broader uh, uh, you know, fidelity of what we're trying to create from a law enforcement and an unarmed response uh, intervention piece. That's the biggest thing for me is to the 100 cops that I command is to know where they're each at with their space. And again, with the trauma, I think this is something that is the next iteration of law enforcement is we talk about uh, the impact of trauma to victims, to community members that live in these densely populated areas that are exposed to violence, domestic violence, substance abuse. And we're really trying to infuse needed mental health resources to them, which it should be because that's a crime driver. But we also have to deal from a leadership standpoint in law enforcement, and I don't think this is working. Are we, deal, are we addressing our officers' mental fitness on a daily basis? Are we talking about it? Just like in communities that we all know and work in, there's a stigma behind talking about how we're feeling, if there's anxiety, if there's depression, if I can't get out of bed, and that's causing me not to have a job because I just can't motivate myself because I got so much on my mind. Or why isn't my chi child thriving in school? Well, because when they go outside, they see yellow tape every two months and they can't focus on school. For a PD, we have to understand that we have to maintain our officers' mental health and mental fitness because they're delivering a service to the community. And oftentimes, and I think Ben's probably heard me talk about this, and is we wonder why situations go bad when we send, we have community members calling for service that have been exposed to sometimes decades of trauma, not only imposed by environmental problems in their communities and violence, but sometimes imposed by over-policing, perception of over-policing and things of that nature. And then we send cops who have trauma as well that's un un undealt with. And then we get these groups together to solve a problem and we go, why did that go wrong? It goes wrong because we're not having these conversations as a, as a law enforcement community, not just LAPD, not just Chicago PD, but normalizing those discussions within our group to take care of ourselves, to be able to provide better services to the community. I think that's the, the next iteration and will provide a better police product to the communities that deserve it. Well said, Captain, thank you. Uh, ben? Yeah, I, I think uh, it's been a matter of transparency and trust and really understanding um, what our roles are uh, and we're dealing with uh, communities that may have trust issues. Uh, and, and we often, as interventionists, serve as buffers, as liaisons, that the, the interaction, uh, what law enforcement is bringing to the communities, uh, whether it's to solve crimes or kind of work together so, so things can uh, work for us in the community. For instance, uh, events. So our constant communication and, and kind of being transparent, let's say, for instance, there's an event that's going on. You, you can expect this many amount of people to be there from this time to that time. Um, the event, you know, uh, will have interventions there. And, you know, with all due respect, after that, you know, we're out of there, things are done. Kind of like what uh, Chief Cato was talking about, you know, uh, if there's an event, uh, don't want to necessarily send law enforcement in there and see what the interventions can do. Uh, and, you know, hopefully everything will go smoothly. Uh, however, there have been cases where, you know, folks wanted to do a pop-up event, um, you know, kind of create their own environments, and it, it wasn't under the, the agreement, professional agreement that intervention might have with uh, PD. And as a result, things just don't seem to go right. You know, you have situations and uh, things develop and folks go to jail. And it, it just turns out, and then again, that 
uh, generally is uh, as a result of non-communication and uh, not having that understanding of what the event is about, you know, who would it involve uh, on both sides, whether it's the community, uh, let them know, you know, hey, this is what's allowed, this is what's not allowed. Um, and again, you know, if, if that's not communicated, that's not translated, then again, we, uh, we do see challenges with that. Also, uh, you know, as things develop, you know, the culture changes. There's um, some things that uh, we're not necessarily uh, privy to. There, there's things that happen in our communities that we get caught off guard. And, you know, there's some protesting going on. Or some other things that are going on don't necessarily have to do with our day-to-day -day community folks. And sometimes those things are kind of like, again, out of our hands, kind of goes against our protocols on how we engage and, and how we interact. And again, those are some of the instances where we'll yield and uh, you know, law enforcement will deal with things the way how they would normally deal with. Thank you, Ben. I mean, as I, we have about um, a little, maybe 11 minutes left uh, for the conversation, then we'll open it up to questions. The, as I stated in the beginning, the public safety, the understanding of public safety in the country is evolving and we're pushing for that, where it's not just the domain of law enforcement, there is community agency and ensuring public safety. So I think it would be nice to hear what would, um, why are the co these coexisting roles essential to achieving public safety? And this is, a, it's a broader question, but I'd love to get your thoughts on how you see these roles really generating a different type of safety that this country maybe hasn't seen before. Um, and we'll start with the Chicago folks, but we'll start with Tenny this time and then go to Chief. I love it. Um, I, I feel that from the days in Boston, even though we didn't really see the full picture, uh, we're serving to recalibrate society, right? And that is, we have over relied on 911, right? And I see Erica Ford on this, on this Zoom and those are my heroes, right? Uh, you know, you have Pastor McBride also in Live Free. We, we got to have organizing. At the end of the day, we serve the community and the community has the desire to save itself. Uh, not alone, it's taxpaying community, but they want to do more and they need the resources to do more. And we got to trust that the community, when it's afforded, trained, supported, will do a, a lot of recalibration in our society. We have tried to just discipline people and jailing 600% increases in the last 30 years have, crossed, have really caused the la, the, at least the third reshuffling of the African-American community from being brought here from the expansion West and jails have not given communities a chance to breathe and strengthening and independent and, and I'll say here in Chicago, we went against building a model that is an imperial model. So the Institute refused to grow. It built a partnership, CP for P, Community Partnering for Peace. We reached out to Los Angeles. You guys helped us build an academy here to professionalize our own field. That's our responsibility. But as a partnership, we stand more as equals to 13,000 police officers, apparatus, and Cook County Jail, which I think is one of the biggest apparatuses in the country. So we need to recognize power. We, you know, Chief Cato and I, we care for each other as human beings, but we also come from systems. And we cannot substitute the power of an independent system, civilian system. And, and I think the concerns Sometimes now when the money is coming from ARPA, et cetera, that is gonna funnel through a city and a police, and that's not gonna work. Power is, dignity comes with power, right? And I think we need to remember that, that is the future. We wanna make sure policing and our government regains its legitimacy. We are not anti that, that we, are, we are believing the principles of democracy and people in our neighborhoods are taxpayers and they, deserve the same service from police as anyone else. But we also deal with reality at the moment. There's a journey to get there. And part of it is restoring a civilian architecture that can respond to a variety of issues. Thank you, Tenny. Chief. You're right, that is a very open question. And uh, when I think about 
is first of all, it's the word trust, the ability to take a risk, to take risk. It's, ability, it's uh, also the ability to do things out of the normal. A uh, couple of things I've thought about right away is uh, police can't do everything, first of all, you have, so we have to trust others to help. One thing comes to mind, we had a murder of a mother who was lying on the concrete. Uh, of course, that's my first attention, my first direction, but what caught my attention was a three or four year old sitting in the window. And I asked that three year old for you what, what, what was wrong. And she said, someone shot my mom. Now we have to deal with her right away. I got on the phone and I gave Tinny a call and I said to him, I, you, you told me that if I had a situation where someone had some form of mental illness that needed to be treated, you'd come out right away, you'd find someone. So I said, I need someone to come out and talk to this three-year-old right now. They responded, they provided services not only to that child, but to that child's family. That may have stopped some form of retaliation and slowed some things down. The second thing I think about is during the civil unrest, we had a potential race war between the uh, Mexican neighborhood and the Blacks neighborhood. Mexican neighborhood was protecting their neighborhoods from looters, but at the same time, they were targeting anyone that was Black that was driving through the area. So again, I contacted other outreach workers and I contacted Tinny and we all met. They asked me what I would allow Hispanic gang members and black gang members to meet in the park to have a mediation and a barbecue and a softball. Well, I took that risk. That risk prevented a race war. The following week, we had a combination of Hispanic members and black members decide to have a parade to prevent others from having some form of a race war. So that was a risk that we took. Prior to that, we decided we would have a meeting of to, pre to get ahead of certain civil unrest, we were gonna have a meeting with gang members in the Austin neighborhood. We brought those gang members in and also brought police in. In that meeting, we decided to have a conversation where everyone could be open. At that particular time, I had one female white officer who said that it was unfair that she was judged as a racist because she made traffic stops. I had a black gang member said it was unfair that he was stopped because of the way he dressed and the way he looked. We put them at the same table. While sitting there for that hour and a half, they started defending each other. The goal was, was to have those we thought we had a high propensity to commit violence and a high propensity, high propensity to commit some type of looting act to get an opportunity to meet the police in the area. So that officer, when he drove down the street, he could say, hey, John Doe, and the John Doe could say, hey, officer friendly. Now they knew each other. In the Austin community at that time, we had a very low issue of civil unrest because we took the time to get ahead of it because we had, we had the ability to have a relationship with groups that actually can bring people together. So first you gotta care about what you do and you gotta care about the community that, you, that you're involved with. When you have that, and you take that risk and you provide that trust to others, you'll start to see a domino effect. And we did start to see domino effects. Thank you, Chief. Uh, let's go to the LA folks. We'll start with, uh, with Ben. Uh, yeah, that, that was great, Chief. Um, I, I think what you said, Fernando, is true. The, the evolving uh, perception of public safety, public safety, at least, for us in Los Angeles has always been synonymous with law enforcement, with policing. When we hear the, the word public safety, we kind of connected that with law enforcement. But we know that we're in a day and an age where uh, public safety is an application that's kind of like it's reliant to the community. Anyone who wants the community to be safe and, and has a platform or opportunity to uh, make the public safe. Uh, for instance, so so far this year, there's been 340 homicides in the county of Los Angeles. Uh, 340 people killed as a result of another human being, and, and that could be everything. Gang violence, to domestic, to random stuff. Um, and we're anticipating, and we're mid-year, we're anticipating perhaps maybe another 300 people that's going to be killed. Uh, and we know that any is too many. 
So there is an obligation. Uh, you know, we don't expect it to always just be at the hands of law enforcement, but to ourselves, to the peacemakers, to the people who, you know, get up every morning to stop that next homicide from happening, that next act of violence. And, and as a result of, of public safety, having these conversations, these mediations, that is a, a platform for interventionists, for peacemakers to prevent um, these next acts of violence from happening. So yes, we do uh, include our work as a form of public safety, and we're trying to change the narrative as a whole uh, to the community, what exactly public safety is. Thank you. Uh, we we are seeing just nationally folks looking at building out their infrastructure, community-based public safety infrastructure by, by investing in community approaches, whether it be hospital-based, school-based, um, street-based um, intervention in order to help bolster what safety could look like and reach people that are the hard to reach population that you know folks see as hard to reach. Um, I think when there is that investment and in the building of, of an economy around public safety that is community based, we can see safety increase. Um, and I do think people underestimate how difficult it is and how necessary the infrastructure is, how necessary it is to invest in the wellness of peacemakers, um, as well as making sure that they're paid well, that there's benefits and that there's support uh, for their work because just as law enforcement is taking a chance working with intervention workers, intervention is taking a big chance holding existing within that gray space, right? Where you are in the middle intervening between some, some tense situations, but also making sure that you're not leaning too close to one side or the other to make sure that your objective so that you could see clearly and find a pathway forward to peace. And I think within the larger conversation in this country, you know, there's a lot of organizations here, um, a lot of peacemakers from different cities that we have close relationships. So I want to acknowledge them. Um, I want to acknowledge the, the Alley Violence Intervention Com uh, Coalition in LA, and then CP4P in Chicago, um, who have been really pivotal in advocating for change. But this work right now at this moment, having this conversation about public safety and broadening it out and having law enforcement leaders saying, hey, there needs to be more community support to build out a community-based public safety. It really begs the question on how we redefine public safety in this country. Um, so wanted to share that to help ground the conversation, but we're gonna move into um, Q&A and I know Chief might have to leave soon. Um, so I'll make sure um, I get, um, we get you some questions. Um, but the first question will be this, is both LAPD and CPD um, in, in those two departments, they're strong supporters and believers in community intervention, but it's not shared by all department personnel or officers. No surprise there, I'm sure. How can the believers help change the hearts and minds of those who do not believe and want intervention to become informants? And I'll, I'll um, ask the chief and, and captain to, to uh, maybe respond to this. Well, first we have to lead from the front. We have to actually be out there ourselves first setting the example. And that's what I did early on. It, it took a sale for me at the beginning. It, it took a sale, uh, Tenny's consistency and other groups consistency. And then once I realized how valuable they were, they are to us, uh, I led from the front. I started, I put myself out there. I, I clearly supported what they were doing. I, uh, I, I clearly uh, walked with them in some areas. So we have to lead from the front, we have to be consistent. And then their ability to show what they have to do, they have to prove themselves. There's no doubt about it. They have to prove themselves to the truth. But if we lead from the front, Others will follow, but at the same time, I think it's up to those groups to show what they can do. Thank you. Um, Captain, you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, th I think it just comes back, you know, for, from a policing standpoint is leadership setting clear expectations, uh, not having any gray area of what the role of our intervention workers are. Uh, making sure that our, our officers don't cross those lines, just as the intervention workers, supervision, and what, however the structure works, they know not to cross certain lines as well with the officers. Uh, being accessible uh, from a, in a leadership standpoint to our partners from intervention is key. Uh, my officers know that I talk to 
their venture workers and in the leads of the CBOs uh, through our triangle approach that we here use here in LA, the model uh, for the mayor's office PD inter intervention, that those conversations are happening. So the expectation is very, very clear to my officers. And I, I would have to say the non-believers within LAPD, they're, they're there. I'm not gonna say they're not, uh, but I think through the demonstration of co-response uh, to, to, to violence, uh, the lack of retaliatory incidents after uh, initial acts of violence and the data that has been gleaned from that provides officers with some confidence that this model is working. And then honestly, the, the, the building of that professional training uh, that, that, that our intervention workers go through, us bringing, having the ability for like UPI or LaVita, our grid office to have officers come and speak to, to new intervention workers, that also builds our officers' confidence as well because they feel they have a voice. Many times law enforcement is a uh, leadership tells and the officers do. We have to provide a, a, a platform and a space for those officers to talk about why they might not trust. And usually it's driven by a few officers that just will never believe it. And they're, they're spoiling the whole uh, barrel of apples and we have to deal with that. So. I'm very optimistic about the, the future of collaboration and co-response, especially when it comes to violence. And I think from my early days as a police officer in 2007, when we kind of stood this up in LA, I'm very optimistic in the next decade that, that this is gonna look like something that we, we, we never even believed that it could be. Absolutely, and it comes down to leadership, I think as, as I think Chief said earlier. But I, I wanna also talk about the reverse of that. With intervention workers and street outreach workers, they have the similar pressures as well, because they have to occupy a space that is different, right, as a peacemaker, and that they get they get certain prep pool pushes and pulls from both sides, whether it be from the mayor's office, law enforcement, from the community that either don't agree with what they're doing or even don't understand it. You know, there's cases where even on social media, you have people that don't understand the work, the role of peacemakers smutting up intervention workers or street outreach workers on social media, right, and then intervention workers will get calls about that. So I wanted to offer um, space to, to Ben and, and Tenny to see if you wanted to comment on that, on the challenges that exist with that, because intervention workers are put in tight situations as well. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment. So I, I did a training about uh, two weeks ago in the city, uh, just north of Los Angeles. And uh, in doing that training, it, it had mentioned uh, on that police department's website that they're engagement and interaction uh, with the community, um, not necessarily through means of intervention per se, but through outreach would consist of having uh, confidential informants. Uh, now this is listed on their website that this is their means of outreach to, you know, to stop crime and gangs and have an impact by, uh, have, you know, adamantly getting uh, confidential informants out there to, you know, do their work. And to me, I, I, I tried to express that to the intervention team there that how that could become extremely problematic. You know, if, if you have outreach out there and, and you have uh, confidential informants, then who's who, you know? So I, I, I think, again, um, when we talk about the leadership and filtering that down, uh, through law enforcement, through their protocols, and again, communicating how delicate this work is and how it has to be communicated, what our roles are uh, in, with this professional understanding of working together, um, you know, that our, our work is unique, uh, it's hazardous, and uh, we, we have to be able to articulate what we do to the community in a different format as to what, how law enforcement or even funders, there's a lot of funders that, um, you know, they believe in the work and um, actually may not be able to articulate it the way how we would be able to communicate, it, let's say in a hood uh, level or, or verbiage terminology. Thank you. I, I think um, 
one of the things that helped us here in Chicago is um, we can talk about the models all we want, but we actually uh, interventionist leaders and police leaders went to LA for a visit and we went to Providence for a little visit. It's but when you see how models work in other places and the efforts and the human beings, that interaction, and you're away from your own city, you have lunches and dinners together, you can discuss in a space how it's going to be designed, so and how we're going to work together, so we don't sacrifice our principles and and uh, and sense and building of justice, enhancing do no harm is the first principle. So. First, I recommend travel sometimes away from the environment we're always in. But on the pressures with outreach, you know, we, we discuss, we, we teach nonviolence. We go through principles and steps. We, we look at the steps, how people act. Sometimes it's not perfect and it's not pretty. Uh, I called uh, Chief Cato when he was a commander, but one of my outreach workers uh, complained uh, near a crime scene how he was treated. And... Chief Kate already had the video and, and saw what happened. And our guy was in the wrong. And I learned from that first, Tenny, gather your information before you run and start complaining. So sometimes it's not perfect, but it's keep working on it. Running a nonprofit that deals with intervention and such hot button issues is not a normal task, right? Like you said, we now have two clinicians for the first time. We have a team of 10 staff who volunteered from different departments to look at their own well-being. For too long, we had, and I think uh, Captain talked about it, we have traumatized people from both sides. We're unleashing them on the streets, and, and that's not right. We got to get the support, but we got to do the work to support our people. Too often, people thought in the past, we thought, you know, you just go and hire a few people who were in gangs or committed violence. No, it's a very unique group. I always quote to my team, there's the few, the proud, the Marine. Well, there's the fewer, the proud are the outreach workers, right? It's a very select people who can do this work. They need to be supported. HR and all those things are really, really complicated when it comes to this work. And we need stability in the field. So... One of the concerns now that I know I sh we share with Fernando and others around the country, as well as Susan Lee, who worked in both cities, do we have the capacity and will the country give us the time to build really an infrastructure of a real field, a stable field? Sometimes the media and others will very quickly say, hey, it's not having an effect. Well, it took 40 years to get to where we are. Can you give us a bit of a running space here? And I think that is, that is another part. We need to educate the media as well as the rest of society. What we do together will change those cities, I'm confident, because this is my third city and hopefully my last, but Chicago is difficult. Give us some time. Chief Beck from LA said it takes about 15 years, and that's been the experience in many cities. We need a runway. We need the investments not to be a fad. Uh, and we need to be respected that this is not you write just a great grant and you assemble some people who have a license to operate. The license to operate is not enough. You got to really train people to work and support them and deal with crisis that are oncoming every day. A Amen, Tenny. Chief, I know you might have to jump off. Do you want to give us any final words? No, I, I, I just appreciate you want to continue in this dialogue and showing the importance of the collaborations of both groups. Unfortunately, I do have to make a hard stop now. Thank you for having me on the panel. Thank you, Chief. So the, the next question we have is, how can we work to get intervention work? How can we work to get intervention work done by CBOs recognized by police, city, county governments as a viable solution to public safety issues and not a threat to being replacements for law enforcement, but additional resources and tools to use for public safety? And that falls into the frame of about expanding the understanding of, of public safety. Um, any thoughts on that? If I can just start on one thing, I never want to be on the same grant and competing with law enforcement. Partially is very practical. We have on our team many people with extensive records and they're two in the morning alone with law enforcement officers. I don't want to create any seductions that we are competition or a threat to those law enforcement officers in terms of budget. Budgets of law enforcement need to be discussed on one side of the shop 
and pub public safety in a civilian architecture, whether it's mental health outreach and all those need to be discussed on a completely different, uh, different plane. So if, if I could jump in, I, I, I know in LA that, that that sentiment does not exist with, with PD in any of our uh, partners that we work with that we're trying to, to trying to overcome some of these uh, community wellness uh, issues. I think, you know, with, with, in CSP, we have a very unique relationship with our communities. You know, when this was stood up uh, by Connie Rice and Phil and Amata Tingarides years ago, this, this, we took a risk. The department took a risk. Charlie Beck took a risk and we're growing now. And it is, it is a good model. For, for me, we need to pivot out of this public safety narrative. And as, as members of, 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 of this group that's trying to overcome some of these issues, we need to talk about community wellness because that's what it is. We need to look at the different vectors that are impacting community wellness within our respective neighborhoods. When I came in uh, a year ago back to CSP, uh, and it, specifically in the South LA region, we took a look by asking our community members and listening, what are the impacts that cause you not to have opportunity and hope within your household? Is it lack of housing, undereducation, mental health, substance abuse, lack of employment opportunity, job training, uh, and, and then at the end of the day, crime. And LAPD only fits one of those buckets and we deal with crime. So what we've worked hard here to do is to form relationships and organize and support the number of organizations that aren't police that can deal with the other four vectors that would, so we don't have to. And if we support that through you know, funding, supporting with grants from an LAPD standpoint as just support, being there, understanding that the government organizations outside of LAPD have to be held accountable for capital investment planning, and they actually have to follow through to make these areas more environmentally sound for safety. Uh, our council districts, and we all have to hold each other accountable because there's enough work to do that none of us are putting each other out of business. No one, there's enough service base in some of these impacted cities that none of us are gonna put each other out of business. That all of us have a, a seat at the table to actually have an impact that is sustainable, long lasting, and will be the model for the respective areas because each area is different. So, once people start talking about stuff like that to me, it raises the hair on my neck that there may be alternate agendas because there's so much work to be done. And together, many of these things could be solved probably within my career lifetime, I'll be frank with you, in the next eight years. A lot of this stuff can be solved because we have made great strides. But mutual accountability is something that we everyone has to accept and be able to learn and hear from each other. Thank you. Um, here's another question. Uh, as more public funding flows to CVI, not enough, but more than in the past, what is needed from private philanthropy to support this type of coexisting co-response collaboration? Which is a great question. Where, where can philanthropy plug into this shifting um, narrative and broadening of public safety? Well, I, I think for one thing is kind of obvious, you know, what's going on in our country and our communities. Uh, if there's a sense of empathy or sympathy from the philanthropy, then maybe the outreach is there. Uh, the, oftentimes, small CBOs, they don't know who to ask for the funding from or how to get it. Or sometimes it's the bureaucracy that comes with it. You got to jump through so many different hoops or doing great work. And, you know, trying to get funded is extremely difficult for a lot of the folks that do the great work. 
I found it in my travels that 90% of the work that we do in outreach is volunteer. Uh, so it, it's not that it's an occupation driven type thing where folks really want to get involved for the money, uh, but for the compassion that they have. Uh, and, and sometimes it's hard to communicate that to folks who have the dollars. Uh, uh, in most cases, they don't want the warm fuzzy stories of how you, you know, change someone's lives or the community. Uh, but the data, the data, they, they want to see the data, how uh, you or your agency may have impacted a community um, through data, you know, and again, oftentimes those platforms aren't always available to prove that. So uh, yes, definitely through philanthropy, through private, you know, philanthropy, who may understand it or who may uh, want to know how they can help is often great for us, but again, we don't always have those inroads to, to get access to them, to tell them where to put their money. Absolutely. Thank you, Ben. Tenny. So really, really important uh, question. I'm really glad it was asked. Philanthropy is important for three things. One is risk-taking. So we have a program, Chicago Cred, help us start around Chicago, which is called FLIP, which takes young people who are still active, sponsors them to be peacemakers in the summer in the biggest hotspots in our city and they're not yet ready to move fully into a profession etc it's the little bridge and that's something government cannot fund it's a very risky program the second thing is innovation which is related to that right there's a so our wellness initiative with two clinicians is funded privately uh, and it's a, it's a pilot so that's another thing the third thing, almost more important, that often we ignore. Uh, I, like anyone, anyone else who are in business or anything else, I want a diversified portfolio. The government has proven to us it's very capricious. It moves back and forth. It doesn't always go as a process that is either fair or consistent or predictable. So you need to have the way to absorb the shock and private philanthropy is the quickest and the most nimble. And we saw that in COVID, uh, philanthropy said to all of us, hey, you can go general operating if you suddenly need all those things, which something government could not do. So you really need a mix of funding to keep this thing going and keep it stable. Thank you, Tani, well said. Um, next question, what kinds of resources are helpful to support communities in building these sorts of collaborations, understandings between police and outreach workers? I think one of the, the platforms that we have is um, continuous meetings, uh, similar to town hall meetings, where you have a community, you have uh, law enforcement, you have government, you, you have a little bit of everybody at the table. We, we do that with the Southern California Ceasefire Committee. It's a voluntary meeting that we host every Wednesday. We've been having these meetings for the past 17 years. And again, it's a platform where, you know, everybody's equal at that uh, table uh, where we can ask questions, uh, get to know each other, what each other's roles are um, at, at, at that platform. Again, because it's kind of like a town hall set up situation, but on a weekly basis. Not just when a crisis happens, where there's a law uh, officer involved shooting or something of that nature. It's not a, a pop up town hall, but something that's continuous where we have access to uh, hashing out uh, issues or upcoming uh, events or collaborating with different uh, events that may be coming. But again, just having that continuous uh, maintenance process, uh, it, it gives us that platform over a period of years. Thank you. Um, another question uh, was, do you in LA or, and Chicago have MOUs and cross training built into your practices? Are trained violence intervention workers acknowledged as first responders? Um, I, I can touch on, on some of the training, but go ahead, uh, Captain Whiteman, regarding the, the law enforcement piece. Yeah, we, we do have training and that's, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been lucky enough, I'm the command staff. Uh, one of my ancillary duties is to be the uh, gang reduction youth development liaison. So all of our gang officers go through certified uh, California post training uh, to be obviously certified to understand what uh, 
our model does what looks like we have a panel of, of uh, intervention workers that come during that, that day. We are trying to get all of our officers through that. We're working uh, with our senior lead officers, which are community liaison officers at each uh, division has about eight to 12 of them. So they understand the role. Uh, we, at, at CSP, we have a very robust training program uh, with UPI uh, CSP school that, that has a lot, it's, it's, it's intervention heavy on that because we want our officers to be able to allow intervention to work and be the first response to issues that are, that are, that are not in progress crimes. Uh, issues where they, unarmed response and, and uh, to be able to resolve issues is very important to us at CSP because it, it limits that conflict and it empowers and grows the capacity of communities to be able to problem solve on their own. Uh, so we've been very fortunate with, you know, to, to grow at CSP with, through, through the direction of obviously Chief Charlie Beck and now Chief Moore, but with partners like UPI that have really given us a really good roadmap uh, as an agency to hopefully grow this. Uh, it's become one of uh, not only the department's uh, uh, key goals, but the mayor's office strongly, strongly supports this policing uh, model. And, and hopefully in the next decade, we see it proliferate in LAPD. Thank you. Yeah, and that cross-training is important. The the we have the alley violence intervention training academy which is 144 hour certification for city contracted workers so the grid partners with urban peace institute to implement that training we've been doing that since 2010 um, but that was a, that was an important piece because in order for law enforcement to have some understanding and start to open their minds to building trust with intervention is that it really comes down to three things is one is they have to know the type of training that they've been through they have to know how to hold them accountable and they have to know what they can expect and not expect of them so we had to make sure that we covered those three things. When we first started training law enforcement, I would say back in 2009, we had intervention workers really leading the training and speaking about their work. And we had LAPD officers there playing with the holsters of their guns, right? But Chief Beck at the time said, look, this is gonna be a 10 year process. Over the years, as you had command or brass leadership really buy in, then it, you know, two, three, four, five years late, four or five years later, you didn't have that anymore. You had officers that were asking questions and, and being more attuned to what intervention was saying. But on the intervention side, it's really important to provide a level of training, um, a level of professionalism, what are the standards, and that there is support. In LA, it has to be black and brown. We have to make sure that we build those bridges ahead of time to avoid any type of misunderstandings, any type of racialized violence and build a field that is reflective of the communities that we serve and that are reflective of the dynamics of the streets. It's not just ethnic dynamics, there's also gang dynamics based on region, uh, based on affiliations um, to kind of larger cars or larger systems or groups. So um, it's something that we all have to take into account when we do the training and make sure that we're kind of acknowledging and kind of respecting some of those you know, boundaries that exist. Um, Tenny or, or Ben, did you wanna chime in? I'll just say that, you know, Providence has a tradition of uh, teaching in all over Rhode Island uh, in academies. Uh, I know in one small city, they trained all the officers. I know that CP4P, our, our collaboration in Chicago, trains in districts. Uh, I think New York does that. Oakland, uh, Ben McBride has been teaching as well. So. Uh, there's different groups that do that, and I think at some point we should all probably convene and make sure we borrow the best practices from each other, but it's a growing practice, and it's an important one. All right, this question, it's going to be an international question, but can someone speak to the current situation in El Salvador, if you all are familiar with it? Uh, where the government has arrested tens of thousands of gang members and collaborators and sympathizers due to a homicide spike. El Salvador has become the country with the highest per capita imprisonment rate in the world, and there are no clear abatement of arrest operations on the horizon. How can we apply best practices from the United States within that context? <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that's a big question. Uh, 
I was lucky enough to be uh, a, a part, I, I forget who brought a group of uh, uh, South and Central American uh, law enforcement leaders up to LA a couple of years ago. Uh, we had some of these conversations. Uh, I think obviously it's a little different with our constitution <laughs> and maybe the laws down there. And if uh, obviously over policing and over arresting isn't gonna solve the problem, it may slow it momentarily. But uh, I think if you look at our incarceration rate over the past 30 years, like uh, Tenny alluded to earlier, uh, that just drives a wedge between governmental uh, agencies, specifically the police or the ones that are carrying out the direction of, of uh, uh, you know, upper upper level uh, dignitaries within governments and the long lasting effects of that. So by doing that, they're probably gonna put themselves back 50 years with any relationship building with any of those community members, including the children that are impacted by those arrests and the families that are decimated and not able to make a viable living, which probably is very difficult already in El Salvador and some of those countries. For, you know, for uh, in, just in my, my very novel uh, experience and, and knowledge of, of, of El Salvador, I, I, that, that police uh, community relationship was already strained even before this. So this only exacerbates that. Uh, I, I wish I had the capacity to speak more on that, but maybe Tenny does, uh, you know, if you have more experience with international agencies. My first recommendation would be to call Brent Decker at Cure Violence. He's worked a lot in Central and South America. He's a great practitioner uh, and his team, right? So I would do that. You know, I've been to Brazil and Guatemala, to North Macedonia and Belfast a few times. And civilian architecture always matter. Civilian capacity always matter. Now, in Salvador, there's more of a crisis, as was in Guatemala, and lack of stability. So there's no simple solution. We cannot just export models, but there's some principles that do matter. Uh, I think there's an interesting book that just came out by Chris uh, Blitman at, uh, at University of Chicago on how actually most groups, whether it's Israelis and Palestinians, whether it is uh, historical and whether it's Medellin, how most groups actually avoid conflict. They know the cost of conflict. So there's some opening there as well. What's the calculus of avoiding conflict and learning from that? It involves a little bit of CBI, cognitive behavioral therapy, which Heartland Alliance in Chicago is a leader on that. And they're building a national academy. So there's some opening. I know it's kind of a very general answer. I'm not an expert on Salvador, but there's some opening there uh, resources to work with. Yeah, I mean, just I guess the one comment I would make is that we kind of rest away out of the problem, and, and we've learned that, and you know, we've learned that in major cities throughout um, the United States, and so, you know, that that response has been, you know, attempted many times. And short term, you know, it could suppress some violence and crime, but long term, you do a lot more destruction. And so, um, big conversation, I, I think, to follow up with that. Um, so here, here's a, another question, which is a great question. Um, what steps can be taken, and we have about 10 minutes left, maybe a little bit less, nine minutes. What steps can be taken to safeguard and prevent co-opting of intervention workers and CBOs by law enforcement as a means of controlling them or keeping them silent on certain issues that are issues within the community? Taco, you, uh, Ben, you wanna hit that? Yeah, I, I would say uh, the vetting process. I mean, uh, in doing this work, um, there is a vetting process, a background check, uh, you know, offline background check. Who, who are you? You know, what's your intentions uh, to come to this community, the better community? And, um, you know, those are safeguards. It, it's not that um, we want to ostracize anyone, but this work isn't police work. Um, you know, for those, if, if they want to be uh, a police officer, we can uh, give them some direction on where to go apply and who to talk to. You know, if, if that's the route that they want to take, but uh, any covert operations that, that would include, uh, you know, you being a, a source of intel for law enforcement, 
it just doesn't work. It's not practical in the work that we do. So again, you know, just betting out, uh, you know, who wants to come on board and, and do this work um, and kind of like just explaining how it works, the protocols of it, um, you know, that works for us, the, the betting process, the, the background check, uh, the community background check, and them having the capacity to do the work, their license to operate is important in doing this work. So that is extremely helpful in uh, identifying the people who want to do the work and what's their capacity to do the work. Because they might have good intentions to really do the work, but maybe they might be a better fit for law enforcement, you know, and, and not intervention. I think the not being co-opted is is something. This 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 work has to be lay, led morally. Uh, it's a risk. It's you got to know the risk. I, I would do a simple example. You don't use a motorcycle to move your apartment. You move. You rent a truck, right? So there's certain tools as which I wish we were, but we are not. So that's why we partner with organizers, right? I mean, I'm very conscientious that we have. People who are vulnerable late at night in the community, and I'm I'm maybe too cautious, right? And knowing some of my partners around nonprofits around the country, I'm more vocal. Uh, we push and we talk about justice and we educate. And at the same time, we have gratitude to people who are really pushing hard. I have read at least 10 abolitionist books. I look at them to check myself. Uh, is the reform, are we violating what Martin Luther King wrote from Birmingham jail when people told him, slow down on your changes? Uh, and he wrote a famous letter. It's a key fun foundational letter that, no, we got to push hard. So this is a conscientious work. We got to ask ourselves questions. I, I think that we try and educate what are the risks for us, that we're working very often on the ground to change the violence fact but we need in the society from the outside the pushes and they're part of the community pushes for really more fundamental changes. It won't happen just with us building bridges with law enforcement. We need the community's voices and organizing to constantly push and be heard. Thank you for that. Another question, um, is there a preferable way for police departments to support slash fund the aftermath of neighborhood trauma that results from police involved shootings? PD may create the situation, but does not, maybe does not assist with the cleanup after the efforts on survivors and witnesses. So my personal experience from, from my seat is, my expectation is that we do. I know Chief Moore's expectation is that as well, uh, as well as my Chief Amata Tangaridi. So, just we we have a, a a family liaison unit out of the chief's office. So if officers of LAPD get involved in a officer involved shooting or a critical incident that 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 may have sustained impact in neighborhoods, the family liaison unit goes out to explain the process to those impacted. So whatever family members may be in the household or beyond. Uh, to help them navigate through our department system of investigation. And this is, a, this is an act of transparency. So that's just something from a one-on-one -on -one family department link. Now, do sometimes those families don't want to be connected with the family liaison unit? Yes, and I understand why. You know, LAPD just may have been involved and shot your, your, your child. And why am I going to sit here and talk to you about it? Uh, I think it's very important to be proactive about department policies and agency policies with the community. I don't think uh, it's, 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 it's a good uh, look when we have an incident and then, it, you know, we're trying to explain why it happened after the fact. I think that's part of us engaging not only with the community, but with our intervention workers as well. I, uh, I was a gang lieutenant in Newton Division, which is uh, in South Los Angeles. And we had an officer and a community member uh, get involved in a, in, a, in a pistol battle and they both were shot. Luckily, they both survived. Uh, we had done a lot of, uh, because we knew this area was 
higher risk to police community conflict. So we had done a lot of work uh, with our, our grid partners up there, specifically a gentleman uh, by the name of Big Will, who was our intervention worker, who really uh, let us in and, and work with him and, 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 and get that community rallied to listen to, to give us a space to talk about why we do what we do. Uh, that night of the shooting, we brought Big Will to the command post to tell him little information about what happened and why it happened for that rumor control. And Will was instrumental in helping us tamp down those rumors. And then we brought community in to show the transparency uh, of the investigation from the inspector general that we have in LAPD. That's our, our, our watchdog and explain the shooting policy. And we, we release uh, some video, a uh, 45 day release of officer involved shooting on videos like many departments do to show the public uh, what happened and provide a slight narrative about what happened. And then there's also always the follow up where we, we don't do it ourselves, but we ask some of our partners that may be in the area of the mental health to go out there and do outreach for, for trauma impact on it. And then we always have to understand uh, to utilize our faith base, our schools, all the partners in the area to provide information, receive information about tone and temperament of communities so we can go back in there to provide public services to them. Uh, and then we have to be empathetic and understanding and aware of the sentiments of that community after these events. And then we have to work hard on building back. So that that's a, uh, there should be more protocols based upon that. I'll be frank with you. I, I, I don't think we have some best practices that we use in CSP, but it, I don't know if the agencies have uh, best practice protocols set place within manuals and guidelines. So we have one minute if anyone else wants to chime in on that. Okay. Well, thank you, Captain. Uh, I wanted to say thank you to our panelists, um, Tenny Gross, uh, Captain Ryan Whiteman, and Ben Owens. Um, thank you for all the work you do, the years uh, you've been doing it, um, you know, your willingness to invest in this conversation. Um, and I'll hand it back to Jordan Costa at uh, Giffords. Thank you, Fernando. Um, and thank you all for sharing your time with us today to participate in this important and timely conversations. Uh, attendees, please show some love to our panelists in the chat as a thank you. And I wanna make sure um, to thank all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to listen and ask questions. If you haven't already, please drop your name and organizational affiliation in the chat so we know what areas are being represented here today. I and mean, maybe your contact information if you'd like to be looped into communication surrounding future events like this one. Um, we covered a lot in these four episodes and we hope you walked away from these conversations learning something new, whether that's a better understanding of what CVI really means or more about the uniquely demanding responsibilities of CVI workers and how to support them, or maybe just a renewed perspective on what the future of public safety could look like. Um, if you have a moment, please stay on to hear some final remarks from our partner in this series, Executive Director of the Northwestern Neighborhood and Network Initiative, Soledad McGrath. Thank you, Jordan. Um, you've covered everything beautifully. I just wanna uh, give a, a brief thanks to Paul Carrillo and the, his wonderful team at Giffords for their partnership in co-developing and co-hosting this series. Using a community engaged model at N3, we seek to marry the expertise and lived experiences of our partners with network science and other analytical tools to answer timely research questions about how to build safer and healthier communities. And I want to thank all of our speakers today and all of the wonderful leaders who were able to share their expertise throughout the entire series. Um, if you were not able to join us for the prior sessions, we do invite you to view the recordings at your leisure. The link is available in the chat. Um, as Jordan mentioned, we were only able to feature a small sampling of the incredible work happening throughout the country, but it is this and all the outreach, direct service, advocacy, research, and more happening every day that challenge us, challenges us to do more and to do better in our respective roles to further amplify and strengthen the critical role that community violence intervention strategies play as part of our broader public safety infrastructure. We thank you for joining us today and for the work that you do every day. Please enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.